Phones on mute. Tim, here we go. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Tim Ports. I'm the executive editor of Biomass Magazine, and I want to thank everyone for joining us this afternoon for our webinar entitled, Is Your Biomass Plant at Risk? Dust Explosion Prevention and Protection Strategies. Uh, we've been working on this webinar for the last week. I've seen a lot of the content, and you are all in for a very uh, dense webinar loaded with great practical information. We all know dust explosions can present serious risk within a biomass facility. Ignition of a dust cloud in process equipment can destroy the primary vessel, propagate to interconnected equipment within the plant, causing secondary explosions with devastating results. Fortunately, there are proven ways to address this threat, and this webinar reviews how and where explosions initiate and propagate steps in a hazard assessment to evaluate areas of risk, dust collection, and housekeeping strategies for minimizing the overall risk to the facility and the various methods of deflagration protection that can be employed to protect facilities against explosion. Today's webinar is populated with three presenters with incredibly robust technical expertise, and I look forward to hearing from them, and I know you'll appreciate what they have to say. A couple of housekeeping items. Uh, we will be accepting questions today for all of our presenters. Those questions can be submitted using the GoToMeeting webinar portal. Uh, additionally, today's webinar is being recorded, so uh, that will be a, an opportunity for you to access uh, information uh, in, the, in the presentations uh, in the future. Finally, there is a camera icon in the upper right hand of your viewing screen. If there is a particular slide that you just have to have uh, right now, you can use that camera to actually take a, a screenshot of the slide that's in view. Uh, I want to point out that today's webinar is sponsored by IEP Technologies, and this webinar uh, is available because of their support. So certainly want to thank today's sponsor, IEP's Technologies. Uh, before we continue, I want to just again thank everyone for joining us. Uh, great content today. Our first presenter this afternoon is Marty Schloss. Marty is a professional engineer at Sintera. Uh, Marty, looking forward to your remarks. Uh, the floor is yours, sir. All right, thank you, Tim, and welcome to our presentation. To give an overview of what we're going to be talking about today, we'll be talking about the principles of a combustible dust explosions, the primary and secondary explosions throughout the facilities, hazard assessment and ignition risks, dust extraction and collection, housekeeping, explosion protection strategies, and process vessels at risk. Um, in a biomass plant, there's many vessels that are at risk of an explosion. And they can occur inside of vessels where a dust cloud may be per present. One is in particle size reduction. That would be hammer mills, chippers, grinders, hogs, that type of equipment. Conveying equipment, especially at where you're transferring between, say, two belt conveyors and you're dropping the material three or four feet. Storage bins as you fill them or empty them where you're going to have a dis dust cloud generated inside of it, dust collectors, cyclones, pellet coolers, and that includes fluidized bed dryers, and rotary dryers. If you see on the right-hand side, you're going to see the results of a combustible dust explosion. So a lot of these aren't just a minor small fire. You're having something that's a major disruption disruption to your business uh, and your employees. The characteristics of an explosion, you can see on the right-hand side of it, is a dust collector that was run as a test. 
and you're going to see fireballs coming out of both sides of that uh, dust collector as well as coming back through the fan. The characteristics of an explosion, they commonly begin with the ignition of a fuel that burns very rapidly. And they're going to produce a large sudden release of gas. And an explosion need not involve a fire. Uh, a fire may not result in an explosion, you know, but you can, uh, an explosion and a fire need a method of ignition. When a container bursts from increased internal pressure, the sudden release is called an explosion. The dust, combustible dust pentagon requires the same three things that are required for a fire which is the fuel, which is the combustible dust, oxygen, you know, as an air source, some type of ignition source, electrostatic discharge, arc welding, welding, uh, heat, an open flame. If you have those three, you'll have a fire. If you have dust suspension in the air exceeding the MEC, which is the minimum explosion concentration, it's going to result in a flash fire. If that flash fire is confined, is in a room or a vessel or a building or ductwork, that's when you're actually going to have the deflagration. If you remove any of the part of combustible dust as the fuel or the oxygen or the ignition, you can't have a fire and you can't have an explosion. So you need all five of those things to have a deflagration inside of a dust collector or piece of process equipment. The next slide is going to show an enactment of that. You've got confinement. This is similar to a dust collection. Dust collector, you got oxygen inside the unit. You have fuel. You have dispersion. And you'll have ignition. When the ignition starts, you're going to have cool compressed gases on the outside of it, a pressure wave that's going to lead the, front, the flame front, and that's going to result in what the explosion happened. So again, you're going to have pressure being released before the flame is actually going to be released. So. <clears throat> and that shows on the left-hand side of this screen, you're going to see the point of ignition. You're going to see the flame front is the first set of circles out, out here. The pressure wave, which is the next set of circles around here. And you're going to have the cool compressed gases on the outside of it. So the flame speed is about 30 feet per second. The pressure wave is going to be handling about or traveling at about 1,100 feet per second. I'm going to show a video in the lower right-hand corner that was produced by the Chemical Safety Board, which is a typical type of an explosion. This was an accident that they uh, investigated inside of a foundry, and the equipment is a drop box where the heavy material was supposed to fall out coming into a dust collector. You're going to see as the explosion goes, and the fire travels through each one of these areas, you're going to see the results of it. You're seeing everything coming in. The explosion started in a dust collector. It blew the doors off the dust collector. The fireball traveled back through the drop box, which caused it to explode. The pressure wave continued down the pressure wave and fireball continued down the ductwork back into the plant. This was an aluminum foundry, and those are aluminum fines. The vibration of the explosion caused the dust that was built up on piping, roof uh, joists and everything to come raining down. The furnace was actually open, so you had an open ignition source onto it and uh, resulted in a flash fire throughout the area. Unfortunately, the worker that was depicted standing there perished in the fire. Uh, he survived initially, but was two or three days later 
uh, died from the burns that he received during the fire. So something like this is very intense. You have to watch it where it's going to happen and how fast it's going to happen. Okay? A typical explosion event, and we're going to show this is from the time of the explosion till the time it started till it's over. And if you look across the bottom, these are milliseconds. So at zero up to 300, 300 is three tenths of a second. And what this is depicting is you have the initial internal deflagration inside the process equipment is going to start. The first thing that's going to come out of that is going to be that pressure wave, which is going to send a shock wave through the building. The shock wave is going to bounce around inside the building and is start going to bring the dust off of the rafters. It's going to stir the dust up that's on the floor. And it's going to get everything up in the air and airborne into a dispersed dust cloud there. At that point, you're going to see in the green is depicting what that dust cloud looks like all the way through that area. At about 3 tenths, and this again, if you're looking at this point, that's less than a tenth of a second is when you're starting to actually release the dust cloud into the building and have a diverse cloud. Okay. At that point, the process equipment, then the fireball is going to be released from the process equipment. And you're going to see it start going. The yellow depicts the fireball. And as it's uh, expanding, it's chasing the, the fuel, which is your green area that's into it. And again, you're a little over a tenth of a second when this is happening. The next part of it is is the secondary explosion uh, deflagrates throughout the interior. And that's when all of the dust that's inside that building is starting to burn, starting to expand, and causing pressure onto the building. And again, at that point, you're building is pretty much full of flames and you're about two tenths of a second. Okay. The secondary deflagration is going to vent throughout the structure. The building is probably not rated to withstand this much pressure. So it starts knocking walls down, starts blowing roof panels off of it, and starts releasing it to the atmosphere. Again, from the time it starts to the time it's over, you're looking at a little bit over three-tenths of a second. A lot of times, you, if you're in a building and you can see a fire, you can get away from the fire. You, know, you have time to react, time to get out of the building, and an explosion, it's over before you're reacting. So if you're looking at equipment or if you're looking at uh, explosion protection type thing, type equipment, you're going to have to have equipment that's going to respond in less than three-tenths of a second. So it's not a very long event. What will happen is this explosion that you just saw may trigger another one in a different part of the plant to a different part of the plant, and it will just cascade through it. Imperial sugar in uh, Savannah, South Carolina, or Savannah, Georgia, started in a tunnel underneath uh, some silos, and by the time it was done, it had brought almost the entire building down around it because of all of the secondary explosions with it. Your chances of getting injured go up tremendously from not the explosion, but from these secondary fires. And that's why when we get into housekeeping, it's important that housekeeping is uh, emphasized so that you don't have that secondary buildup of material. Right. When they run a, a deflagration pressure versus time test, and some will say, have you had your dust tested? They put it into a vessel, uh, atomize the dust and a very fine particulate, and you're going to get a curve where 
it's showing the ignition and you're going to see how fast that pressure built up, time is across the bottom, pressure is above the top, and it's going to get up here, and then it's going to level off and start dropping off. Okay. Uh, just as a quick note, this may be 110 PSIG is what the nat maximum explosion is. Your dust collector is probably designed to be around 15 PSIG, if that much. So it's not that you're close with uh, standard equipment. You run the risk of an explosion completely demolishing that equipment. And they'll talk about a big number you'll hear is KST of a uh, material. And KST is really looking at how fast does it explode. The KST value is a calculated value, and it's measuring on this curve where you're going to end up with the maximum pressure rise over the maximum uh, t or over the minimum of time. So the KST is that delta P over delta T times the volume of the test device to the uh, one third root. So that's bringing it back to the volume of what the test vessel is. So you'll hear about KST values and uh, one of the first questions people ask you when you're going to start looking at combustible dust is what's the KST of your dust. Okay, In deposited dust, <clears throat> you're looking at the different chemical cap or capabilities of it, how ignitable is it, how flammable is it, Will it ignite on temperatures or hot surfaces? The self-ignition properties, does it go exothermal or it heats itself? The exothermic decomposition of the material, impact sensitivity, if you drop uh, a crescent wrench on a concrete floor, does the impact actually cause the explosion? And then also what your electrostatic properties are. So these are the things that you need to consider when you're looking at what your risks are and what the risk of the dust that you're actually producing in your plant in the different areas. The dust in a, in a cloud form, what you're looking for, is it explodable or non-explodable? You'll buy a dust test and it'll say a go, no-go test where you're just testing to see is it explodable or is it not. The minimum dust, ex, minimum explosion dust concentration, that's how much material is in the air to actually cause it to have a deflagration. If you don't have enough, it's not going to support a deflagration because the heat transfer between the small particles isn't going to be high enough to heat the particle next to it. The minimum ignition energy, how much energy does it take to cause that? It could be anything from a spark off your finger to almost welding torch type material. If you're going to nurture your material or your air streams, is what's your maximum oxygen level for inerting? Uh, some things run in a nitrogen blanket. You look at what's the maximum explosion pressure the maximum rate of pressure rise, that goes back to calculate your KST. And your hybrid dust clouds, which is an explosive dust mixed with gas, that it's actually going to increase the KST and, the, uh, and it's going to decrease the ability of some equipment to work in preventing the uh, or mitigating the explosion. And then what are the electrostatic properties of what that dust is? So when you're looking at all these things, you need to take these things into account. To kind of give you an idea, uh, on the right-hand side of it, this is your industrial hygiene range. In the middle of that is 500 microgram, uh, which is the dust standard for most dust. This is a nuisance dust that you don't want to be breathing anything worse than that. Okay. So that you can barely see. The explodable range is 100,000 times that 
uh, rain, that density. So you're going to, you cannot see through a two to three feet through a dense cloud. So just a little puff of dust isn't going to get it. You need to have quite a bit of dust that's actually going to cause the explosion. Okay. What is a PHA? And a PHA stands for a process hazard analysis. And what the process hazard analysis does is it looks at each one of your processes to identify and analyze the hazardous situations associated with the process or activity. Uh, if you take, on the left-hand side of it, if you take little dust chips or little wood chips and in the middle you run it through your chemical processing, on the right-hand side what you're looking for, you're looking at is the results that if you have real fine dust in the dust collector and what that explosion is going to look like. So as you're doing this, you need to look at what are your hazards all the way through it. PHAs have long been used in the chemical industry to really analyze what could go wrong and, and what safeties are in place to keep it from going wrong. And now they're required by NFPA for combustible dust so that the you're thinking about what all your hazards are. You know, what's included into it. You know, you're going to look at the physical and chemical properties of the materials. You're going to look at the design of the fire and explosion safety provisions for the building and the process. You know, if for some reason your building has a lot of dust buildup, you've got to protect the building as an explosion enclosure. And the results of the PHA should be documented and maintained for the life of the process. We do quite a few PHAs, and a lot of times people say, well, what do I need to do? I said, you've thought through what your process does. You just need to document what you thought through. So, But it's going to finalize it and give it so that it's your document that's going to be your roadmap going forward. They should be reviewed and updated at a minimum of every five years. The purpose of a, of a PHA is to meet the NFPA standards that form the basis of safety. That's prevent or limit hazardous atmospheres, prevent ignition in the hazardous atmosphere, limit the consequences of a deflagration to acceptable levels. The acceptable levels is uh, defined kind of loosely, it says what the company and the authority having jurisdiction, and the authority having jurisdiction can be anybody from the fire marshal to OSHA that's going to say these are, this is an acceptable level of protection. Ultimately, OSHA is at the top of the food stream, and what they decide is the final word on it. Okay. NFPA standards that are involved in this is NFPA 654, which is combustible dust, combustible particulate solids, NFPA 664, which is wood processing, NFPA 61 is agricultural and food products, 484 is metal dust, 68 is ventilation of deflagration, 69 is explosion prevention systems, and in the next year, they'll have the fundamentals of combustible dust will come out at 652, which is going to be kind of a clearinghouse of all of the other standards, uh, the standard parts of each, each of those. But you'll still look in each one of these things for specific applications. The PHA, who should be on the team, your maintenance and facilities, your process engineering, your production people, environmental health and safety, your engineers, the consultants, if you want to bring somebody in on the outside of, that knows the process, equipment manufacturer's representative, and your corporate engineering safety or Q&A. So you want everybody that's got a, a say in how that process is run to be involved in it to make sure that you're accurate in what you do. Items to consider in a PHA are material properties, 
material flows of particulate analysis, each step of the process, the equipment, compliance with standards, process knowledge, operating procedures, work practices, contractor management, which says in contractor management is important as you need to train your people and you also are responsible for making sure that your contractors are trained for combustible dust. Any site constraints, workforce involvement, ignition sources, hazardous identification. Okay, and then you look at what are the levels of the PHA, things that are easily identified, like the front of a power panel missing. Things that require more code information, which is, you know, that you once you put the power panel cover back on, you can't put boxes 36 inches in front. And then more technical information is what size does the wire need to be feeding that power panel. There's different types of methods that, that are used. We're not really going to get into those, but like a what-if checklist or hazard and operability study or HAZOP, a failure mode and effect analysis or FEMA, characteristics of a dust hazard. You need to take the sample, the identification of the dust, particle size distribution, your moisture content, chemical concentration, heat of combustion, melting points, rate of explosion, that's delta P over delta T. These are all things you need to be looking at as you go through it on your PHA. This is a list here of the different types of machines and really what tests should you have that are using that type of equipment. You know, uh, you know, manual pouring, you want to be looking at MAE and explosion screening. Uh, so you're looking at the different, different types of characteristics of each one of the uh, pieces of equipment. They're classified as ST1, 2, and 3 dust. One is a KSD value of 1 to 200. Uh, two is 201 to 300. Three is 301 and above. Uh, typically, three is above 300, and that's more metal dust. Some plastics are up there. But some of the things is on wood sander dust may have a KSD as high as 224. And a lot of typical grain dust have a KSD of 89. In the pro maintaining the process sources of ignition, and the only thing you can't mitigate and claim complete control is mitigation of ignition because things will always turn up a short circuit, lightning, sparks, those types of things, but you have open flames, friction, hot surfaces, smoldering and burning conveyed materials, mechanical impact electrical sparks from the equipment, uh, exothermic reactions, those are all things that can happen in your ignition sources. As well as things that you can control where you're looking at work practice of smoking, no open flames, light bulbs, hot work, grinding, electrostatic discharge, tramp metal in your material. So a lot of these are things that you actually can have work practice has an impact onto it. Again, process control of the fuel sources, material handling equipment, as well as natural gas and utilities, combustible vapors as part of the process air stream, and materials not captured by hood and dust extraction. So a lot of these processes, you need to look at all these different items to do it. Okay. Work practice control for the fuel sources. Maintenance of fuel source equipment. Uh, it could be forklifts. Uh, housekeeping plans and housekeeping uh, procedures to make sure you don't have a built up of dust. Also getting the waste removed and also raw material storage and handling. And that is the end of my presentation. Again, if you have questions, you can submit those, and, uh, and hopefully at the end of it, we're going to have time to, to uh, 
answer those questions. Thank you for your time. Marty, terrific presentation. I think the uh, particularly the information about the importance of thorough PHAs is a fantastic foundation for uh, the two presentations that follows. Before we continue, I certainly want to draw attention to uh, today's webinar sponsor, IEP Technologies. IEP Technologies, the name to trust for explosion protection. IEP Technologies is the worldwide leading provider of explosion protection systems and services. For over 60 years, IEP has provided protection solutions that can suppress, isolate, and vent combustible dust or vapor explosions in process industries. IEP Technologies can support biomass and ethanol operations through locations in the United States, Germany, Switzerland, the United Kingdom, France, and Turkey, designing and servicing systems with a dedicated team of application engineers, regional sales managers, and field engineers. The IEP Technologies process, precise protection for every application. IEP Technologies has more worldwide experience protecting a wider range of facilities against explosions than any other company. With well over 15,000 systems installed, IEP has developed a unique process to ensure the highest level of protection for your facility. The IEP Technologies process includes material testing and engineering site visits, system design, installation, commissioning, and maintenance. IEP Technologies also offers on-site training programs for the proper operation and understanding of your explosion protection system. You can't afford to let an explosion threaten your critical facility. Let IEP work with you to keep an explosion from impacting your bottom line. Call IEP Technologies today. Additionally, please stop by the IEP booth at next week's International Biomass Conference and Expo, booth number 604. Once again, thank you to IEP Technologies for sponsoring today's webinar. At this time, I would like to hand the webinar off to our next presenter. Kurt Boston is the Global Manager of Torrent Production Technology at Donaldson Company, and Kurt will be talking about combustible dust and dust collectors. Kurt, go ahead. Thank you, Tim. So as Tim said, what I'd like to do is spend a few minutes talking about collectors, um, and I'll touch on why you might want a collector in the first place, why and how you might make decisions between various collector designs and options that are out there, and then we'll kind of wrap up with some conversation around mitigation of combustion events in collectors, how do you protect them, and what are some of the strategies, and then Dave will take you through a lot more on the specifics of those mitigation strategies. So when we look at why you might procure or, or put a dust collector into service in a facility, there's really a number of common reasons for doing that. One would be to improve your indoor air quality. As Marty indicated, a dust collector can be one of the ways that you limit the fuel for a secondary explosion in a facility. You might be putting a collector in in order to control ambient air quality, in other words, to control what you emit or, or send off site. Uh, you might find that a dust collector allows you to bring air back into a facility that you've already conditioned or invested in. There may be advantages there. And one of the most, one of the last and, and common reasons is you have a product that has value to you and you want to keep it within that production stream. How do you keep it from being discharged? So the classic here would be uh, venting of a bin or a silo where you want to maintain the dust within that silo. If we, if we think about dust control strategies and what the options are in the market today, what, what we start with is the more traditional centralized collector. This is what most people think of when we talk about dust control. It involves a complex system of ducting that goes out to some large centralized dust collector and you pull air from all sites and all locations on a continuous basis. A more current and, and more frequently utilized approach today is what we often refer to as point of use collection, where you're using smaller dedicated collectors that are installed closer to the point of control. Uh, some of the advantages there is that it allows you to run dust control and, and the expense of those fans and that air displacement is limited to only when you need to for the process that's running. 
it decouples these systems so that if there is an issue in one area of the facility, other areas of the facility can keep running and keep operating. Um, so we're seeing a, a drift in that direction in, within the market. The other thing you're looking at when you purchase dust control is how am I going to measure its performance? So what kind of efficiency and reliability am I going to have? What physical space will I have available to me? What utilities will I have available for me to operate that dust collector? Do I have compressed air at that facility or not? And then the all-important, what's my cost going to be? And we look at cost in two different purviews, if you will. What are my one-time expenses for capital equipment? mitigation equipment, installation, shipping costs. And then there's those ongoing costs that you face day in and day out as you operate the equipment. How much is it going to cost me to run that much horsepower for a fan or consume that much compressed air? What are my service and, and replacement air requirements going to be? And what am I going to have to pay to dispose of this material once I've collected if it's something that I can't reutilize within my process? So you factor all of those in, you start looking at it, and one of the things that comes to the top very quickly is, what kind of efficiency do I need? In other words, when I put a collector in, how good does the air quality have to be leaving that collector? Mechanical collectors are probably the least expensive to purchase and operate, but they only work moderately well when you're dealing with the very heavy coarse materials that can be separated by gravity. The more common area is to look at what we refer to as media filters. This is where we think about bag filters, cartridge filters, pleated bags, uh, product we offer, power core. And within that family, you look at what's the material that I need. Conditions may drive some of that, but when you look at bag filters, they're typically very effective on moderate to large particulate. 10 microns and larger is where you tend to see bag filters used. If I need efficiency on very small particulate, you know, less than 2.5 microns or less than 1 micron in size, I'm going to be preferentially looking at cartridge power core pleated bags in order to achieve those kinds of efficiencies. And, and those kinds of technologies can offer very low emissions levels. You know, less than 5 milligrams per cubic meter is very common, and you'll actually see instances where you might be dealing with micrograms per cubic meter for a particular contaminant. What do these things look like when we talk about a mechanical collector? The, probably the most common mechanical collector people think of is just a simple cyclone collector where you're using the centripetal force to help um, remove heavy particulate from the airstream. Bag houses come in lots of different shapes and sizes, round bags, envelope bags, uh, oval bags in, in dimensions from a few feet in, in dimension to you know, hundreds of feet in, in dimension in some of the large power plant facilities. Cartridge systems are much the same way. They may be large, small, they may be indoors, they may be outdoors. Uh, they come in a lot of different configurations for elements. And one of the things that we see now that behaves similarly to a cartridge is what's referred to as a pleated bag. You kind of see those in the upper right-hand corner. We take that bag house and replace it with media that's more similar to a cartridge for efficiency. And you see those depicted there. And then another packaging methodology for filter media is what we refer to as power core, where you're taking media, condensing the packaging so that it's very small. And these products tend to be much smaller in size, so they allow that point of use application that you're looking for. Uh, that image in the lower right is an example. You see a large traditional bag house being replaced by a much smaller, much more compact power core unit. Uh, in that particular application. So there's a lot of things to think about with regards to the collector strategy and how you want to deal with the dust that you're going to be managing. There's installation consequences that you'll face as a result of those choices. And those choices will also fold over and influence what's happening in the fire and explosion side of your protection or impact strategy. So let's look a little bit about those. All right, if you look at the statistics, Dust collectors, unfortunately, rank really high in almost every statistical study done. Here's three of them that covered various periods of time. And su surprisingly, dust collectors are the number one site of incidents in all of these surveys, uh, beating out, in many instances, the big family of unknowns. And so the question comes, why is a dust control device or a dust collector such a frequent location for these combustion events? And it's not to do with the design of the collector. It's more to do with what we ask the collector to accomplish. So as Marty pointed out, typical con concentrations of dust when we think about a facility are in this industrial hygiene range. You know, 500 to uh, 1,000 micrograms is not uncommon. Where we run into issues with combustion, where we start to worry about explosion characteristics and combustion characteristics, is when the concentrations have increased 100-fold or 1,000-fold. 
if you think about the operational objective of a dust collector, if you retitled it, a dust collector could probably be better defined as a dust concentrator. And in many instances, the dust collector is the first, if not the only piece of equipment that while operating actually takes dust that's in a dilute form coming to it and concentrates that dust to much higher levels. And so it's not uncommon for a dust collector to be the only place where you can find contaminants at a concentration that becomes explosible. So it's not a relationship to the design of the collector, it's more what we ask it to do. Now, as Marty said, mitigation strategies come out of the process hazard analysis, and there's a lot of different aspects that factor into that. Dust control is one of them. There's prevention thoughts and protection thoughts as well, and ignition control is one that everybody thinks of when we talk about where these strategies start to play. I'll kind of cover these step by step, but we're going to start with how do we avoid an event in the first place? And if we go back to the traditional fire triangle, you need an ignition source, fuel, and an oxidizer in order for combustion to occur. If I remove the combustible dust by substitution or in some other way changing my process, I no longer have a combustion risk. If I change the oxidizer, if I use nitrogen to displace it, I can remove the risk of a combustion event. Neither one of those works very well in most technical applications or practical applications, so we're almost always looking at how do we stop ignition sources from having a potential impact and causing a combustion event. And there's really two approaches to that, what I'll call passive and active approaches. In a passive system, I put some sort of a device, as an example, a spark cooler, into the duct system. And as sparks pass through that, they're disrupted. And, and the ignition sources are extinguished as a mechanical exercise going on. But there's no effort to detect the presence of the spark. This process occurs constantly whether the, the observer is doing anything or not. In an active system, what we do is utilize technology that actually monitors for the presence of an ignition source, triggering some subsequent event. In this case, an identifying uh, sensor upstream detects the presence of a spark and creates an extinguishing environment downstream that takes that spark and disperse, dispels it. Um, these systems tend to work constantly, they fire when necessary, and that ignition source uh, extinguishing region is closed down when it's not necessary. So it's on and off again on a regular basis. Most of these systems have special circuitry in them so that if you see a constant stream of sparks, you might get a different reaction. It might, as an example, shut the system down. So when we talk about active systems, what we're usually mentioning there is the presence of some kind of a detector to trigger an event. If we look at the collector itself and we start asking ourselves what kinds of special circumstances do I need to fold in or factor in as I look at a combustible material that I'm working with, there are some guidance on what kinds of materials you can use for construction. Filters can almost always be combustible material, but we start looking at what's the dust properties. Marty pointed this out in the minimum, minimum ignition energy. If it's a below a certain threshold, we may need materials that are conductive or charge dissipative to protect against electrostatic ignitions. We may have guidance that tells us that dust systems have to be designed in a particular way and bonding and grounding practices may need to be followed as a consequence of that. And typically what we're looking at there is you know, resistance between components not being greater than 10 to the 6 ohms to ensure that we don't have a buildup of a static charge. We talk about dust control. That dust control can also be a prevention method. Marty did a nice job of commenting on the fact that limiting fuel for that secondary explosion is a method of protect, protecting or preventing the more catastrophic aspects of a combustion event, and that's that secondary explosion. Most of the uh, news reports you see where there's fatalities or major losses from a capital standpoint occur not as a consequence of the process equipment experience in a combustion event, it's the secondary event which leads to those kinds of losses. So putting in dust control is a great way to, to help eliminate the risk of that. If we think about how do we prevent secondary events, what we're looking at for the dust collector to do is to stop having fuel enter into that system and to avoid the dispersion of the fuel. Duct work and, and hood design helps there as well. You know, this is a classic example where you'd walk up and have no question recognizing that there's some risks associated with a facility that looks this way. But when we talk about explosion and deflagration risks, what are we really worried about? Well, 
how much dust is too much is something that the standards give you some guidance on. Some real quick measures are if more than 5% of your facility's footprint has dust more than a 32nd of an inch in thickness, that amount of dust dispersed presents a risk for a secondary explosion or deflagration. Simple rules of thumb, if you can't tell what color the equipment is because of the amount of dust that's sitting on it, then it's probably too much. Uh, housekeeping is one that people look at regularly, and I've heard a number of folks explain that when somebody chooses to use housekeeping, the recommendation they give them is put your business card on a horizontal flat surface somewhere in the facility, and when you can't read it, you better clean again. Um, so it's just an idea of how you judge whether enough is too much. And the 5% is really intended to recognize that if you look at your facility, there's a lot of surface area above the floor. In this facility, the lights, the piping, the conduit, the raceways represent a significant amount of surface area for which dust can accumulate. And when that shock wave hits these surfaces, the dust that's on them is coming down. And it will, by nature, become a dispersed fuel source for that secondary event. So avoiding that is one of the things you can do by better controlling dust at the point of generation, as well as practicing really good housekeeping. Reducing that is a mitigation approach. Housekeeping works really well. It doesn't have a lot of capital cost to it. It does increase on your labor costs, but for some facilities, that's a perfectly acceptable way to do it. A more common way from an authority having jurisdiction standpoint is to limit the amount of engagement necessary and you start looking at dust control. Yes, there's more capital cost, lower labor cost, uh, but you've got to figure out how do you do this in a fashion that's effective. Bear with me for a second. Okay, so if we start looking at what are those strategies, there's really two mitigation strategies that you can look at. Actions that I can take that avoid an event, what I refer to as prevention actions, and actions that I can take that are going to control the damage that results if an event occurs despite my best efforts, or what we often refer to as protection events. So when we look at avoidance, prevention, we're trying to figure out how to stop the fuel from being there, stopping an ignition source from being present, or stopping the dispersion. This is hooding, installation of good duct systems, management of bonding and grounding to manage ignition control. Suppression may fold into this as a way of avoiding a secondary event. Where most of us spend much more of our time in conversation is on the protection side. How do I control damage to as minimal a level as I can afford in the event that there's an explosion or a deflagration or a combustion event? And this may be driven, this may help drive decisions on what style of collector I use, where do I physically place the collector, what kind of systems may I choose to employ for fire and explosion protection, do I want to put in a suppression system. An area that's gotten a lot of focus recently is how do I isolate the equipment so that when that pressure wave leaves the process equipment, it's not only leaving out through the explosion relief panel, but I'm stopping it from going back into the building through the inlet ductwork. And then on fire control systems, you'll often hear now conversations around abort systems so that I don't allow the flame front from a fire to come back into my building through the ductwork. Outside and inside, you know, where do I put the collector? This may be driven in part by combustion risks, but it may also be a reality that I physically don't have space to put it inside or I physically don't have space to put it outside. Uh, I may want it in one or the other location because of serviceability issues or in order to be able to properly insulate it. OSHA has really clear instructions that says, although there are alternatives to out of doors locations, they don't want it indoors unless there's special circumstances. You know, once it's outside, it's a lot easier to mitigate. The risks of expansion beyond the collector are much narrower. It's just a much more acceptable location for the equipment. And don't put it on the roof because if you have a combustion event, the last place you want to fight that is on top of your building where the combustion event might expand. Standards could also come into play in terms of how you size the system you're working with. So NFPA 664, which was mentioned earlier on wood control, stipulates that when you're sizing your dust control system, you have to calculate the capacity of that system based on all the hoods being open or at least equipped to ensure minimum velocities through all sections of the system. Those velocities, if you're dealing with metal, have to be maintained throughout the system at relatively high velocity, so 3,500 to 4,500 feet per minute depending on the material you're working with. So it's good to have a familiarity with the standards and understand what they might drive for system requirements. When you start working on those systems, what you'll discover is ductwork needs to be kept short, straight. Where you put the collector may be driven by how do you meet that expectation. 
You may not be able to blend certain operations together into a centralized system. Grinding and polishing, as an example, for metals have to be separated. And there are strict prohibitions when you're working with combustible dust about manifolding dust collectors together uh, into a central system. And what we talk about there is when you manifold collectors, you're collecting pieces of ductwork or piece of process equipment, excuse me, into a single collector that don't have any other connection otherwise. So you do get some exemptions. If the ducts are coming to a collector from a piece of equipment or process that's already interconnected anyway, then manifolding is not a problem. Uh, or if the ducts that come in from unassociated piece of equipment are protected with isolation devices, you can manifold into a central system. But this is one of those areas where you need to understand what your ramifications are for mitigation before you make the system design. Collector features, we'll cover a few of these. When we're working on venting of a bin or a silo, as an example, whether the collector goes on the bin or sits off to the side of the bin can drive some decisions on what you have to do for mitigation. If it's on the bin, you may not have to provide the same mitigation steps as you do if it's sitting off to the side. Um, as an example, bin vents that mount directly onto a hop, uh, tank um, that displace air during following a filling or blending are permitted to be located indoors or outside without explosion protection as long as the device they're sitting on is properly protected. If I relocate that same collector next to the bin and duct to it, I now have to supply isolation devices. I need to provide explosion suppression and protection for the collector on its own. So I may have more capital expense associated with that uh, than I would if I had located it directly onto the bin or silo. Another point is where you put mitigation devices. So a common conversation we have with many customers is when you look at explosion venting, there's a requirement within the venting design practices to take into account what we call the maximum flame length or the distance from an ignition point to the explosion relief panel itself. For the same collector, locating an explosion vent on the side of the collector may allow for a higher degree of protection than if that vent were on the top of the collector because there's a change in that maximum flame length or height. If you look at where the vents are located relative to a bag house, if the vents are below the bag so that there's no interference, you may be able to reduce the amount of volume you have to protect. If the vents instead are more like what you see over here on the left where the vents above the bottom of the bags, I may have to increase the volume that I account for because I'm going to see a reduced performance on those vents because the bags temporarily obstruct the vent as they're blown through. So where you place the mitigation device is something you have to take into account as you go through your design constraints. Construction of the equipment, you know, it needs to be designed entirely of non-combustible materials. We often get a question on why aren't you using plastic to build your collectors? Well, we can't because plastics are generally combustible. So we have to work with materials that are non-combustible. We do get some exemptions on that. Things like the filters themselves or explosion relief panels can be fabricated from, non from combustible materials. But in general, you're trying to stay away from things that will burn when you talk about construction. Where do you get help and assistance? So as an example, as a manufacturer of dust control devices, we try and provide assistance in what styles of collectors are available, how do you compare the different sizes and where you might physically locate the collector, and how do these mitigation strategies that are out there integrate and coordinate with the dust control devices that are available on the market. And there's resources such as our website as well as our local staff. And with that, I think I'm done. A terrific presentation. Uh, just really know that our audience is appreciating the highly technical uh, content that we've heard so far today, and certainly don't expect anything less than today's from today's last presenter. Our final presenter this afternoon is David Granda, and David is the Vice President of Sales at today's webinar sponsor, IEP Technologies. David, uh, looking forward to your presentations. Go ahead. Okay, thank you very much, Tim. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so far, we've 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 heard about uh, some of the some of the hazard assessment um, uh, steps that one has to take. You're trying to determine just where are the threats that we have within the facility for a combustible dust explosion to occur. Where are our potential ignition sources? Some things that 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 should be considered when you're looking at ways to control those ignition sources. Uh, trying to minimize the combustible dust uh, buildup within the facility, uh, trying to manage the fuel 
uh, through proper dust collection, uh, through proper uh, uh, housekeeping, and basically trying to make sure that all of the steps are employed that would minimize the chance for an explosion to have uh, to occur under normal operating conditions. Unfortunately, abnormal conditions occur. You know, bonding and grounding straps, we know that with, uh, in, a, in a biomass plant that's handling uh, wood dust, uh, electrostatic ignition certainly is, a, is enough ignition energy to start an explosion and under the right dust conditions. Uh, you may do bonding and grounding. Someone might forget to connect the strap or strap might break. You could have magnetic separators that uh, are picking up metal to try to minimize that, that ignition threat going into a grinder. Well, maybe some stainless gets in or you get attrition of the mill itself. The point is there's a lot of abnormal conditions that can occur or upset conditions. And because of that, both NFPA um, and OSHA require that, uh, that uh, explosion mitigation, explosion protection has to be used for vessels such as air material separators. That would be dust collectors, bag houses, cyclones, uh, particle size reduction equipment, um, storage vessels such as bins, hoppers, and silos, uh, conveying equipment, whether it be mechanical conveying like screw conveyors, drag conveyors, uh, vertical conveying equipment like bucket elevators. Uh, but there's also other types of equipment that we see specific in the biomass industry that we've seen subject to two explosions. We had a recent, uh, we were called in recently on an application in which a, uh, an ignition source was carried in uh, to a gravity head uh, fed uh, pellet cooler. That ignition source found a dust cloud and created a, uh, a pretty substantial explosion within the pellet cooler. Uh, the same uh, si similar situation happened in a rotary dryer where an ignition occurred in a rotary dryer that typically has particle sizes that are that are large larger than uh, uh, that would normally be considered uh, an explosion threat. So we know that there's a lot of different uh, ignition threats that can happen within the facility and uh, in these upset conditions. And because of that, NFP and, and OSHA requires some sort of, of explosion protection on many of these vessels. Now the five uh, explosion, uh, most common explosion protection methods that can be used are containment, inerting, suppression, venting, and isolation. I'm going to quickly touch on the first two. Uh, containment is building the process vessel strong enough so that it can handle that 100 to 150 psi overpressure that could uh, be seen during uh, an explosion. Not generally a common practice for most of the process equipment that you're going to find in the biomass industry. Um, uh, mills and grinders, just because of the inherent uh, construction, very usually very, very stout construction, uh, may be able to act, act as a containment type of vessel. There's some other considerations with, with, with them because of uh, flame propagation. But uh, that's probably about the, the most common uh, instance where you'll see containment used at a biomass plant. Inerting is removing the oxygen down by the use of CO2, nitrogen, argon, maybe even flue gases, to drop it below the minimum necessary for, for combustion to occur. Inerting is typically used in batch type operations or in what's called a closed loop application where you're taking the exhaust air from the process and returning it back in as your, as your uh, conveying air and then have, introducing a nitrogen or CO2 blanket so that you drop below that minimum necessary for combustion. Again, not very common in a, in a typical biomass facility. So the, the, the explosion protection uh, methods most commonly used would be suppression, venting, and isolation. Now explosion suppression systems are systems that are de designed to detect and suppress an explosion within milliseconds. The principle in which an explosion suppression system works is that during that incipient stage of the explosion, so in the, some of the curves that Mar Marty had shown early on, uh, during that very start of the explosion, you have a relatively slow rate of pressure increase. Uh, during that period of time, pressure activated detectors are designed to sense uh, the, the, the pressure buildup from the deflagration, and then within milliseconds, extinguishers are activated to discharge inside the, the process vessel and the interconnecting duct to both suppress the explosion and to stop flame propagation to, to other vessels. 
Now, an explosion suppression system is basically a very, very fast fire suppression system. But unlike a fire suppression system, which responds to smoke and to heat, an explosion suppression system will respond to primarily to pressure and then in some cases to a radiant energy. So, we, so like a fire suppression system, you have detection, control, and extinguishers. The, extingu the detectors themselves are typically pressure activated. And there's two basic styles of pressure activated explosion detectors. Uh, there are the static um, or threshold type detectors. Uh, those styles of detectors which we see in the upper left hand corner are are detectors that are set to a fixed set point uh, during the commissioning of the system. That fixed set point is typically uh, one half psi to three quarters of a psi above the above the maximum operating pressure of the process. Uh, typically mounted with vibration isolation, so that uh, vibration uh, that might be applied to the vessel due to uh, product uh, maybe pulsing or product bridging with an operator essentially uh, you know, banging on the vessel to break that product bridging loose. You certainly don't want to have a false trip from that. So uh, vibration isolation is commonly employed in static type de detectors. The second type of explosion detector, pressure activated explosion detector, is this one that we see on the bottom. It's called a rate of pressure rise detector. So instead of looking for a certain pressure threshold, it's looking for an explosive rate of pressure increase. And the value in that is you can filter out uh, operating pressure variances uh, by, by simply looking for a, a high rate of pressure development. You're also able to detect uh, very early in uh, low pressure applications, such as uh, VAC systems. Regardless of which style we're talking about, typically you need two sensors in, in, in an AND type configuration so that both sensors have to activate in order to uh, trip the explosion suppression system. The controls are certainly the brains of the explosion suppression system. They monitor the circuits. They, when they see uh, detection by both uh, sensors, they would activate the suppression system. Uh, one, of the, one of the really important features, though, of a control panel is to be interlock with the process equipment. Uh, the NFPA codes require that anything that moves product or air through the protected volume be shut down should the system be disarmed, disabled because of a trouble, or actually discharged because of an explosion. And that makes sense if you have, uh, let's, let's, take a, uh, let's take a dust collector. In a dust collector, you have a conveying fan. You might have a rotary valve on the discharge. You probably have uh, solenoids for the, the bag cleaning mechanism. And if someone is going to change socks or change filters, they disarm the control panel with the key switch. They do the maintenance with the system in the disarm position. Without that interlock, they may not remember to turn the system back on again. So it's really important that that inter uh, equipment be interlocked. Um, in addition, if you have an explosion, you certainly don't want, there could be some residual smoldering or burning material. You certainly don't want to um, continue to operate the rotary valve and maybe send burning material farther downstream where it may find another uh, a vessel and, and create a secondary explosion. The extinguishers for explosion suppression for biomass facilities are primarily um, uh, filled with a sodium bicarbonate based dry chemical. Uh, that, that same suppressant is used both as a, an explosion suppression agent and as, a, as a, an explosion isolation agent, which we'll talk about in a, just a couple of minutes. Um, Unlike a fire suppression system in which you may have uh, some cylinders and uh, uh, some manifolding and a, and a piping network to get the agent uh, piped over to a vessel, we don't have the luxury of time. We have to get the agent front to the flame front within milliseconds. For that reason, for explosion suppression systems, the extinguishers are hard mounted right to the side of the vessel. And uh, they discharge. Uh, literally within 30 to 50 milliseconds, you'll have a complete discharge of an, an extinguisher. Extremely fast, high agent velocities. And it has to be that fast in order to catch that explosion in that shallow part of that explosion curve that Marty had shown earlier. Uh, typically, we use uh, 900 PSI nitrogen as the driving force so that we get this very high agent velocities. 
here is a graphic uh, depiction of an explosion suppression system in action. So we have detection occurred early on during the explosion, and very, very quickly the extinguisher will have uh, discharged. Uh, again, based on the principle that pressure traveling at the speed of sound is detected, the fireball, although initially probably something in that uh, uh, 30 to 40 feet per second range, uh, will not have grown very big uh, before it's been uh, arrested by the flame, uh, by the suppressant. To give you a, a sense of how fast that suppressant has to discharge from the extinguisher, uh, we'll discharge a bottle. I'll run that one more time. Those are one-foot grids on the back. You can get a sense of how fast that agent velocity is. It's about 250 feet per second agent velocity. Now, in order to design an explosion suppression system, uh, the explosivity characteristic of the fuel is very critical, as well as uh, the vessel strength, the vessel volume, uh, actually the vessel geometry, operating conditions, what sort of operating pressures and temperatures uh, we're going to find within that vessel. And basically, that information is, is plugged into a computer model that takes into consideration some other, some other factors, such as detection set point, how far you have to throw the agent, even if you're throwing the agent uh, vertically or horizontally. And, uh, and from that, the computer model will determine uh, the efficacy of an explosion suppression system design. Explosion venting is uh, one of the most common, if not the most common, explosion mitigation method that's used. And an explosion vent is an opening in a process through which combustion-generated gases can, uh, can flow and expand. And the whole purpose for an explosion vent is to minimize the deflagration pressures within a vessel uh, below the level at which you're going to have rupture or sometimes even deformation. Explosion vents uh, come in a lot of different styles. Uh, some of them are um, some of them are flat. Some are domed. Some are square. Some are round. Some are rectangular. Uh, some of them are rupture-style panels, such as the style that we see here. Uh, this one in the lower one is is called a center fail, and you'll see some laser cuts on this uh, on this vent. And then there'll be a a portion of the metal that's not cut through. That's called a stitch. And the frequency and the width of these stitches basically determines at what pressure a given vent is going to open up at. So that's a center fail type vent. The ones that we see over here are perimeter fails. So basically, the laser cutters are around the perimeter, and they basically hinge open. Um, there are other styles of vents that are on the market. Uh, some have shear bolts. Some are magnetic latches. Some are spring-loaded. Uh, we've even seen gravity type vents. Um, the, the, again, the whole purpose is just to, to, to open up fast enough so that that pressure can be relieved during a deflagration. They're passive devices, so the first thing that, as, a, as, a, as an owner of a facility, that's going to be very attractive to you. So the first thing you want to do is, when you're trying to assess what explosion mitigation method to use, is you're going to say, can I direct this fireball to a safe area? It's critical that explosion vents be aimed at an area where there's no personnel, where there's not going to be uh, within the flame ejection area, where there's not going to be um, buildings or vehicles or foot traffic or sidewalks or parking lots or what have you. Um, that fireball is typically going to be seven times or larger uh, the volume of the vessel. And it's going to extend out in a flame jet, um, oftentimes uh, greater than 50 feet. So it's absolutely critical that when looking at the use of explosion venting, that you try to, to, to visualize where this fireball is going to be directed at, and is this going to be creating a, either a life safety hazard or a property, uh, a property damage issue. Here is just a simple example of a vent. The red vessel it has an explosion vent on the top of it. So you can see a pretty substantial flame out of a relatively small vessel. The whole goal for a vented explosion is to keep the reduced pressure below the strength of the vessel. A couple of terms I'm, I'm hoping you all can take from this, from this graph. Uh, the first one is the opening pressure of the vent. It's called the P-STAT, or the static pressure which the vent is going to open up at. 
once the vent starts to open up, it does take a finite amount of time for that pressure relief to fully, um, to fully be realized. And that would be at the top of the graph where we see what's called the P-RED, or the reduced pressure after venting. There is a, a gap, there is a difference between the opening pressure and the reduced pressure that you're going to have in venting. So it's really important that if you have a vessel that has an opening pressure of 1.5 PSI, your vessel is rated for 1.5 PSI, that you recognize that you do not have adequate venting. It does take time for the full effects of that vent to occur, and the P-RED is always going to be higher than the opening pressure on the, on the, on the vent or the P-STAT. Now, NFPA 68 has uh, formulas for uh, determining uh, the vent sizing for a particular um, type of uh, enclosure. Um, the picture that we see here, you'll see some vents along the side. Actually, it's on several different uh, areas, uh, elevations on this, on this outside dust collector. And you can see it's elevated, so throwing a fireball is what's considered uh, by this customer a relatively safe uh, location. They do have other issues. They certainly have propagation threats back through the inlet. In this case, they take their air back through the exhaust, back into the facility, and I'll address that in a few minutes. But that, those are both areas of explosion isolation requirements. Uh, one other thing I wanted to mention about standard explosion vents. It is allowable to use standard explosion vents for inside vessels, provided that you have a duct to the outside. That duct has to be um, short. It should be straight. Uh, pressure hates to, to, to take corners. So, you're, so the longer the duct is and any sort of bends or elbows, you're going to get a lot of back pressure, um, which is going to ultimately result in either having to oversize the vents or beef up the vessel to handle that, that overpressure. Uh, NFPA has some formulas for determining what that back pressure is going to be. Um, but essentially, unless you're right next to an outside wall, uh, the formulas uh, are very punitive if you have to uh, duck that fireball uh, very far. So it's really important that if you have a vessel and you want to, it's going to be an inside vessel and you're going to put an explosion vent on it, make sure you account for that, what that back pressure is going to be to, to make sure that the explosion venting solution that you use is not going to still result in enough overpressure that the vessel is going to uh, peel apart. Now there are, um, there are some um, what are called flameless explosion vents that can be used for inside vessels. There's a couple of different styles that can be used. The first style would be a rupture panel with an enclosure over the top of it. And this enclosure is basically made of a wire mesh or a metal mesh that acts as a heat sink. Uh, the second style, which is, which is what's shown here, is basically a spring-loaded type of explosion vent, again, with a metal mesh around the perimeter again, to act as a heat sink. And so the idea for the flameless explosion vents is to allow the release of, of this fire, well, not of the fireball, but of the explosion, uh, combustion-generated gases into the building without having flame ejection into the building. Uh, explosion, uh, flameless explosion vents uh, cool the fireball to something around 180 to 200 degrees F. So you do have to have a safe zone around those because certainly at that sort of temperature, when it, when it happens, if someone's within that uh, within that vicinity, there's there, there'll be some life safety implications on that. So they, they do have a purpose in the market. Uh, there's a there's a um, um, there's a there's a place for for flameless explosion vents on on applications. Usually, if the application is a little bit smaller, maybe under 10 cubic meters, uh, it, there's a there's a um, good potential for, for this to be one of your explosion mitigation solutions. Regardless of whether you're using explosion suppression, explosion venting, flameless explosion vents, or uh, even containment, those protect the vessel, the primary vessel that you're, that you're addressing. They do not stop flame propagation. And flame propagation uh, can travel through infeed ducts. They can travel through exhaust ducts. They can travel through the infeed chutes or discharge chutes or any path that doesn't have a mechanical barrier in between uh, the, the primary vessel and any interconnected vessels. And because of this secondary explosion threat, NFPA and the OSHA Combustible Dust Directive do, do require that explosion isolation be installed uh, in paths through which flame can propagate from one area to another. There are two basic categories for explosion isolation. 
there are the passive and the active explosion isolation. Active explosion isolation would be having an extinguisher located on the interconnecting duct, chute, pipe, or whatever we have. That extinguisher would be triggered to discharge and create a chemical barrier inside the duct itself, regardless of whether you're using explosion venting or explosion suppression on, on the vessel. So the purpose would be to create a chemical barrier to mitigate any flame from traveling through that duct or, uh, or pathway. A mechanical isolation valve would be, uh, the one we're showing here is a high-speed knife gate style valve. Um, th this valve probably would not be uh, typically used in the biomass industry simply because of it's a it's a very very uh, costly type of valve uh, that was is more suited for high value product so very expensive products such as the, maybe the active ingredients found uh, in a manufacturing of uh, pharmaceuticals uh, so of some sort uh, because of the high cost of these valves typically a chemical barrier or some of the less expensive passive barriers uh, would make more sense for most of these um, biomass uh, explosion isolation threats. One of the lower cost types of valves would be a flap style explosion isolation uh, valve, a flap style uh, passive isolation valve. And basically these valves are, are, are essentially check valves that are right within, uh, within uh, in a duct, uh, typically on the infeed of say a dust collector. What happens is the dust laden air would travel through the valve the airflow would open up the gate and allow that, that material to pass through to the dust collector. Should there be an explosion in the dust collector, pressure front, again, traveling faster than the flame, would cause the gate on the valve to close, creating a mechanical barrier prior to the flame arriving. So I'll show you a very quick uh, animation of this, of this type of valve uh, in action. So that's at high speed. We'll do this at a little bit slower speed. So now our dust-laden air is coming in, going to the source vessel. The explosion occurs. Leading is the pressure wave, causes the gate to close, and then you have the mechanical barrier afterwards. So this has become a, a, a increasingly popular means for explosion isolation, uh, especially for bag houses, dust collectors um, on the inlet side. So now we talked about, there's a lot of different explosion uh, protection methods that can be used. How do we choose which, which one makes the most sense? Um, certainly the location of the vessel and whether it can be safely vented to the outside is going to be one of the, the top considerations. Uh, the inlet duct con uh, configuration will have uh, an impact. In other words, if it's a vertical duct coming into a vessel with maybe just a short elbow coming into the top, uh, we know that a flap style valve can't be put into a, a vertical configuration. So then a chemical barrier would probably make more sense. Um, the, what happens with the exhaust air from the vessel? Does it get recycled back into the plant or does it go outside the atmosphere? If it's going back into the plant, then the NFPA codes require that explosion isolation be applied. Uh, what kind of operating pressure do we have? Is there an inline fan? An inline fan, basically you take in dust-laden air and bring it through what could be an active ignition source. So there's some considerations on that. And then certainly the explosivity characteristics of the material that's being handled. Uh, if this material has been tested through, um, uh, through various uh, places, such as our Combustion Research Center, uh, to determine that it is susceptible to electrostatic ignition, then, then uh, trying, to, you know, trying to put in explosion mitigation me measures are, 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 are critical, as well as putting bonding and grounding. Uh, knowing the KST of a, of a product is really important, the, the Pmax, because those are all factors that tell people that are designing explosion protection methods, whether it be venting or suppression, how much time they have to react to control that explosion. Uh, some of the other materials, uh, ignition energy, ignition temperature uh, for both a dust, dust layer and a dust cloud are really important characteristics to understand, um, especially if you're doing any heating of this, of this uh, process equipment. The last section we're going to cover today is just some of the most common explosion uh, vessels that are, ex are exposed to explosion risks within, uh, within the biomass uh, industry. And certainly the, the, the most common one would be uh, dust collectors or bag houses. Uh, Kurt did a, did a very good job of describing some of the risks that happen with a, with a dust collector. And, and, and basically dust collectors are, are probably more frequently involved in these explosions than, 
than any of the other processed vessels uh, because they have the finest dust within the whole process. And uh, that's bad for, for, for a couple of reasons. Uh, number one, if you think of dust as kindling compared to a log, the finer the dust size, the easier it is to ignite, just like kindling versus a log, which means the least amount of ignition energy in order to get that composition of material to ignite. Second, the smaller the particle size, the more rapid the combustion event is going to happen. So again, kindling versus log. It's going to burn much, much fatter, faster. You're going to have a much uh, greater rate of pressure increase, and you're going to have much less time to react to it. The other thing about dust collectors is that when they serve multiple vessels and you have an explosion in a dust collector, that means you have multiple areas of the plant through which an explosion can propagate. So the, the risk to the facility is much greater when you have these centralized dust collection uh, devices. So that's why dust collectors are probably more commonly mandated than uh, some of the other uh, process equipment by the various NFPA standards and by the OSHA enforcement. Another type of air material separator would be a cyclone. Uh, cyclones um, uh, separate through um, uh, a tangential inlet and centrifugal force, so the heavies kind of spin out and drop out to the bottom, and then the lights or the fines would come up through uh, uh, an internal tube, sometimes called a vortex finder or a vortex tube, and then oftentimes the atmosphere, sometimes back into the plant, and more than often nowadays back to a secondary filtration device such as a dust collector. Uh, one of the real challenges with protecting a cyclone is that uh, you don't typically find radius explosion vents. Uh, typically, most, most rupture-style explosion vents are flat. So putting a flat vent on the side of a cylindrical uh, vessel that separates by using uh, centrifugal force defeats the efficiency of the, of the unit. So if you can't get enough surface area on the top of the cyclone, um, you're forced to make a decision, do I, do I sacrifice my efficiency by putting a vent on the side, um, or can, can we, do we uh, put explosion suppression on it? So cyclones have their own uh, challenges. Uh, mills, grinders, pulverizers, other particle size reduction equipment, um, certainly one of the most active ignition threats within the facility, oftentimes beefy enough to handle the, the, the initial blast, but the real threat in, in these would be um, an ignition source that forms within these and is then uh, received at the next vessel downstream, whether that be pneumatically to a filter receiver or mechanically dropping into a conveyor or into a hopper or some sort of other collection device, uh, vessel. Um, the explosion risk is not just in the mill, but it's an ignition source. Find the right dust cloud in that next vessel downstream. Uh, product conveying, whether you're pneumatically conveying or mechanically conveying, uh, these are certainly uh, a wonderful path for a flame to travel from one vessel to another. Silos, bins, hoppers. A uh, very high percentage of explosions actually occur within these vessels. Or, or, or these vessels are involved in a lot of explosions, and, and the reason why is a lot of the other equipment that we're looking at, what happens with the product? It ends up in a storage vessel like this. An explosion um, uh, often occur within these vessels uh, when you've got a mechanical feed into the top. You have this, this cone, if you will, of combustible dust within the right dust-air mixture to be within the, the uh, explosion concentration, and then the deflagration occurs. Uh, some of these uh, storage vessels uh, can get quite large. Uh, what we're seeing here is some large silos at a biomass plant up in, uh, up in Canada. And one of, the, one of the challenges with trying to protect one of these is that uh, typically something like this would be very difficult to apply explosion suppression to because of its size. So explosion venting is employed, as you see on the top. But you, these explosion vents are not made to have product against them. So you need to have those vents located above the upper product level. And then the other risk, of course, would be explosion propagation through either uh, in-feed chutes, conveyors, or through dust extraction lines. So this application that we're seeing here, explosion venting was used on the silos. Explosion isolation was used on the dust collection um, coming from the top of the silos. Uh, bucket elevators are uh, you know, mechanical conveyors in which uh, you're, you're bringing the, the, equipment, uh, the material up, uh, in some cases hundreds of feet up in the air. And the main explosion risks that you find in a bucket elevator, at least from the incipient explosion standpoint, would be either the boot, which is the bottom, also sometimes called the tail, 
and the head, which is the top of the elevator. Um, and uh, that's the, those are the areas in which you're going to have dust and suspension, because that's where you're either gravity feeding into them, or you're discharging out the top. So dust, uh, just from attrition of the of the of the of the wood dust, uh, you're, you're going to see some dust that's going to be liberated and and dropping out. So you have enough dust and concentration typically in the head and in the boot or the head and the tail. Those are also the areas that are most likely to have an ignition threat because of the bearings. So um, so concentrating of a protection scheme on, on taking care of the boot and on the head is really important. If explosion vents are used on an outside bucket elevator, then there's nothing that stops that flame from running up through the bucket elevator trunking or casing, whether it be a dual casing like we're showing here or a single casing elevator. So you can, you can see some rather high flame speeds if left unchecked. That's why explosion venting is typically employed about every 20 feet along the length of a explosion or a bucket elevator, and then explosion isolation on the discharge. Doesn't make a lot of sense to protect the bucket elevator with explosion vents and then allow that fireball to to travel unchecked uh, through the dust system or through a discharge and feed a silo, and then uh, you, you've got silos that are that are being destroyed. So there's a, there's quite a variety of different vessels that can can be can be um, uh, subjected to this explosion threat, and each of these vessels should be evaluated as part of a as part of a uh, risk assessment uh, plan. When when you're when you're looking at the, the threats at a plant uh, at a biomass plant, what you really want to do is make sure that when you're looking at each of the different areas, make sure that you're looking at what what, what are the normal conditions and what sort of upset conditions can occur. What kind of abnormal conditions may happen due to due to operator error, uh, due to um, uh, lightning strikes, due to uh, fire? Um, what sort of ignition sources can there be, and how? What sort of ignition controls can be put in place? Um, what's your housekeeping like? Where, where you know where are we going to have residual dust, and how are we going to be able to maintain that residual dust down to low levels so that the building itself is not is subjected to this secondary explosion risk. And by, and, and by doing that, what means what sort of um, dust collection can we employ? Where, where can we get our dust collection at the appropriate capture points? We have to maintain our dust collection at, at, at enough velocity so that we're not going to be plugging up our dust lines and, uh, and minimizing the efficiency of our dust collection system. Um, hazard awareness for the operators. Making sure the operators understand the explosion risk with the combustible dust is, is absolutely critical. Um, so that they that they recognize that they're working around in, a, in a, what could be a relatively dangerous conditions, and that uh, and that they don't do things that can uh, that can uh, make the the situation uh, a bit worse. Management of change. If you're changing the process, you're changing the product, you're changing the temperature, you're even changing the velocities in which you're doing something. Do an assessment to see if this is going to impact either the susceptibility to an explosion or the efficacy of the existing explosion uh, uh, mitigation methods that you have in place. Explosion protection on vessels that are at risk. We just covered that, very important. As well as explosion isolation, making sure that an explosion that could happen in a vented dust collector doesn't travel to other areas of the plant and create secondary explosions. And then knowing what the local codes are, knowing what the NFPA requirements are, knowing what the OSHA requirements are so that you're in compliance should a uh, OSHA compliance and safety health officer come by and uh, do an assessment. These are all things that should be considered as you're, you're evaluating and, uh, and uh, looking at the risks within a biomass facility. Thank you very much. David, thank you very much. Uh, terrific presentations, everybody. Um, I do want to I, I do want to uh, put one question forward before we uh, wrap up today. And this question comes from Jeff Crawford, and Jeff asks, and, and this is a question uh, for Dave, I believe. Um, is interlocking equipment with the chemical suppression system something that is required by code, or is it just a recommended practice? Um, Dave, why don't you take the first crack at that? Yeah, that, that's actually a requirement in NFPA 654 and in NFPA 69. So you now, basically, interlocking the, the, the feed and the discharge and the air going through the primary vessel that's being protected is required. 
as a plant owner, you then have to make a decision. If I shut this dust collector down, do I want to shut down that equipment that we're pulling the dust from? There's no specific requirements for that. But as a plant owner, you may say, if I'm losing this dust collector for some reason, if it's going down, I don't want this process running. Or maybe it's a different piece of vessel that you say, okay, yes, we can switch over. If this silo is being fed and we have to shut it down because of, of an explosion, uh, we're going to still run, but we're going to run and, and feed a different silo. So uh, primary equipment that's being protected, absolutely. The secondary equipment that it's, that it's connected to, that's something that the plant has to make a decision on. Thanks, David. A question that I had, uh, I just want to ask one more question. The question that I had uh, relative and to tie this back to um, the first presentation from Marty, when, when you all in your professional experiences, my guess is that you've been a part of those PHAs that uh, Marty talked about. What, what is one of the most common areas that you feel like maybe surprises people when they're conducting their PHAs, a, a particular problem area that that folks that are listening might um, turn their attention to? Again, just based on your experience, what are some of those things that might jump out at a PHA that, that tend to surprise folks uh, when those PHAs are, in fact, conducted? And really just open it up to anybody that, that wants to take that on. OK. This is Marty. <clears throat> the one thing that, that I find that's most important is to include the operators and maintenance people that take care of the equipment and take care of the process. A lot of times you ask a question, have you ever had a fire? And half the room says no, and the other, and then all of a sudden somebody raises their hand and says, yeah, 10 years ago we had a fire and it about burnt this down. And everybody says, oh, yes, that's it. So you need to have a variety of people involved in it to have a PHA or, or to tell a consultant, write me a PHA. That's not really doing you much good. You want to have your people participate into it and bring up their experience into it to make sure that you're covering all the possibilities. So that's that's the thing I've found the most. I don't know if Kurt and Yeah, this and, is this is uh, Kurt. I think Marty you touch on something very important. I think one of the things that surprises a lot of people in, in process plants is how many near misses have gone on that they weren't aware of. And, and you're absolutely right. You ask the question and, and half the room says no and the other half of the room goes, well you know, about once every three months we have to pull something smoldering out of the duct or, you know, something along those lines. So I think they're often surprised by how many times they've had a near call that never gets reported or, or understood at the entire organizational level. Yeah, I had an experience where I asked the people, I said, do you ever have, you know, explosion or dust collector? And so every now and then they'll go boom and the sides will kind of pop out on it. You know, and I said, well, how often does that happen? Oh, once a week or so, and it, and it was off a blasting operation. And what they didn't realize is those were explosions that just weren't strong enough, but that those were actually explosions inside their dust collectors and that they really had a risk of having these things right next to their production equipment, but they assumed that was normal. So a lot of times there's a, a education that this isn't a normal part of the process. Smoldering pieces of, of uh, material going down the duck are not a good thing. So, I guess I, okay, I have one you. other that uh, that maybe we, we didn't mention too much, but uh, we see it on occasion is when someone is repurposing a process vessel. So maybe it's been used for handling one material at one time and now they're switching over to a different material. So let's take a, a coal-fired power plant that's being now used to uh, burn um, uh, wood pellets. Um, coal dust is a completely different threat than wood dust. Coal dust has a lot less susceptibility to electrostatic ignition. So what you could get by with from a bonding and grounding standpoint at a coal plant, you can't get by with, uh, with wood dust. Um, maybe the conveying, uh, wood dust is certainly much more friable. You're going to get a lot more dust from attrition. So you, you, you might find that uh, where areas that weren't so dusty before when you're handling the coal dust, now by handling uh, wood dust, you're going to find great deals of, 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 of wood uh, fines that have been 
uh, now becoming a housekeeping uh, uh, hazard. Um, the explosivity characteristics are certainly going to be different. You know, some coal dusts have, have, have explosivity characteristics that are relatively low, or with some some of the wood dusts are very very high, which means that existing explosion venting may not be adequate. So just understanding that it's a completely different uh, process when you're changing materials, and that that risk has to be assessed based on what the new material is that's going to be handled, I think is really critical. And Dave, this is Kurt, just to play off of that. You know, repurposing is something that we see as well in the acquisition and, and integration of equipment from the used market, where you, you, you see customers bring in a collector that, you know, is on the used equipment market. It had some level of explosion protection on it, and, and not evaluating that for the current intent uh, is is something that just, you know, when, when I talk to customers, it just surprises me how often they go, well, it has vent, so it must be okay. You know, that that's not the case. You really need to evaluate it to the intended purpose that it's being installed for. Great comments, gentlemen. I want to thank everyone uh, for joining us today. Again, today's webinar was brought to you by IEP Technologies. Marty, Kurt, David, uh, thanks so much for some really fantastic presentations. I certainly appreciate it. I want to remind everybody that IEP Technologies will be at next week's International Biomass Conference and Expo held in Minneapolis, Minnesota. They're at booth number 604. Certainly, if you have further questions, you can ask them of David personally at the booth. Once again, my name is Tim Ports. I am the executive editor here at Biomass Magazine. I want to thank you all for joining us today. And I uh, certainly hope you found it worth your while and continue to pay attention to biomassmagazine.com for uh, announcements of further upcoming webinars. Thanks, everyone. Have a terrific afternoon.